What's going on, everyone? Good Micro Commentaries back at you with a long overdue classic pay per view review. It's been a few months since we've busted one of these out. We've been doing watch alongs and whatnot lately on the channel. So it feels good to get back into the swing of things here with classic reviews. We'll try to do as many of these as we can here this fall. And this one here currently that we're going to do is actually a Patreon sponsored review, courtesy of a great listener and loyal follower, Michael Sem, who donated to have this one done last month month right around SummerSlam time if I'm not mistaken and due to SummerSlam and me being at the event and wrapping up a very busy summer season at my job I knew I wasn't going to be able to tackle this review until the beginning of September so Mike I appreciate your patience thank you so much for the donation and for sponsoring this one because honestly I don't know when I would really ever talk about this show as I think back to the last 10 or so years on the channel I can't think of too many times that this particular show has come up in podcast I know we've talked about the tuxedo match once or twice, probably flair and funk, but really never anything in any sort of detail regarding this show. So this one's going to be fun. It is Great American Bash, WCW. I should say, Great American Bash, 1989. This was actually the first WCW-produced pay-per-view after the Crockett's sold to Ted Turner. So this was kind of the beginning of what WCW would become, and it was a really interesting time. Now, I know a good portion of my audience is very young, and this show is 32 years old, but I invite you to sit back and listen to this review because I think you'll get a kick out of it, or you can even check out the pay-per-view over on Peacock and then come back and watch my review after the fact. And uh, there's a couple of guys on this show that I think are still relatively or semi-active to this day. And it was a wacky, fun, crazy night. And it was a lot of fun to take a look at back at this one again. Now, I have seen this show probably as a teenager all the way through. I, know, I don't have the videotape in my collection, but I recognize and remember the videotape. For some reason, it's got... Flair and Steamboat on the cover when the main event was Flair and Funk, but I think I've rented this before back in the day when I was a kid, and I know I've seen it straight through, but I don't own it in my collection, and it's been a long, long time since I actually watched this thing. It's got a War Games match on there, big classic world title bout between Flair and Terry Funk. We've got Ricky Steamboat and Lex Luger, Sting and the Great Muda, a brilliant tuxedo match between Paul Heyman and Jim Cornette. This thing had it all. So so this is exactly it. It really embodied, I think, what the NWA and early WCW was. It was just fucking out there, man. It was crazy, and it brought back a lot of memories going back and watching this again because I used to love, even though I was a WWE kid, a WWE guy back in those days, I used to love sitting down on Saturday nights and watching WCW. They were just kind of like a you know, more dingy, you know, a little more gritty version of professional wrestling. And it did kind of give you an alternative to what WWE was producing and how their shows were and how their characters were and their stories and angles and stuff like that. This really did offer you something different. Now, as a kid, I didn't even know that I wanted variety, but watching WCW was always a very, very big part of my childhood. So to go back and watch this again, to see a very, very young Sting just starting to come up, really hadn't quite made it yet, but was getting close and uh, very young Steiner brothers, young Lex Luger, so many young talent here that would go on to be huge stars. Pillman is on the show, Sid, Freebirds, Road Warriors, you name it. It is a who's who of wrestlers back in these days. Uh, it amazes me, you know, how strong, you know, when you look back, WCW's roster really was. And they were in the Baltimore arena here and the house was full. You know, they always drew really big crowds and shit. So it was, uh, it was a really fun time. And watching this show again was an absolute joy. My girlfriend watched it with me, and she was cracking up during a couple of spots here, especially the tuxedo match. This thing was an absolute hoot. So we're going to go through it here match by match. A lot of interesting stuff going down and the storylines. And like I said, just a whole lot of wackiness, which I think is what I liked the most about this show. So this, of course, like I said, is WCW Great American Bash 1989. The tagline on this was Glory Days. Went down on July 23rd, 1989 from the Baltimore Arena in Baltimore, Maryland. Arena, I think, is still there. If I'm not mistaken, it's called something else now. And like I said earlier, this was the first pay-per-view produced under 
under the WCW banner after the sale to Ted Turner. Uh, one noticeable face that you will see around ringside throughout this entire show is Jason Hervey from the Wonder Years. Now, Jason Hervey would go on to have a business relationship with Eric Bischoff. I think he would even take an executive role in WCW later on, like in the late 90s and stuff. And I, can't, I don't recall how he really got into it at this age. Obviously, he was a big wrestling fan, and he was right there at ringside. A lot of times he was getting in the way of shit, which was kind of crazy, and you can just see his little face throughout the entire show. Now, the show, The Wonder Years, I loved it growing up as a kid, and he was a little shithead in that show. He was a douchebag brother, so I always viewed Jason Hervey as a heel, and uh, he was actually in Back to the Future as well and a couple other things, but Jason Hervey I always viewed as a heel, so this little shithead is at ringside for the whole thing. You'll get a big kick out of that watching him all over the place, and uh, it was a pretty good-looking house. Like I said, the crowd was full. Back in these days, I went to a WCW house show in 1989, and the fucking place was nuts. There's something about those Southern fans, and there's something about some of those characters like the Flares and the Stings that were just so ridiculously over in that part of the country. And this show was a really good illustration of that because Baltimore, you know, they were they were NWA, man. So it was pretty awesome to see the crowd reaction here, just the atmosphere, the vibe. Everything was uh, was top notch in terms of entertainment value. And then taking a look back at this show in 2021, it was uh, not a dull moment really at all. Now we have Jr. Jim Ross and Bob Cottle on the call. They welcome us and start running through the card, and then they are abruptly cut off. And then they kind of cut to Gary Michael Capetta, who begins announcing the first match, which is this Triple Crown Battle Royal thing. Well, as he's doing that, a little disclaimer on Peacock comes down in the bottom of the screen and it says, quote, presented in the most complete form possible due to original production technical difficulties. So I wasn't aware of this. I don't know how this came off on pay-per-view. I don't know how it looks on the VHS tape. I don't know if they just had some problems or the actual real raw footage was lost because you would think that if this show is in its entirety somewhere WWE would have that. They wouldn't be lazy and put the shitty version on. Well, actually, they might. Uh, but you would think this must be as good as it gets. And the night of the broadcast, they had some issues with the feed and the audio here and there, and they had to skip a couple of things, at least on the Peacock version. So I never really looked into what these technical difficulties were. I didn't see anything in the basic little search that I did. And like I said, I have no idea how it looks on the VHS in terms of editing and if they had to kind of do the same thing there. But to me, it didn't really take away from the show at all. And uh, it was barely noticeable, at least from my perspective. So like I said, we're going to get into these matches here one by one. They start off with what they're calling the finals of the $15,000 Triple Crown Battle Royal. So because there is a War Games match on this pay-per-view, there's two rings there. So they get, they've got this crazy-ass Battle Royal. I think they might have done this a couple of times. WWE never did anything like this. And it's a really kind of convoluted rule set here. So you got two rings, whole bunch of people in this, including singles wrestlers and tag team wrestlers. We've got a very, very young Steiner Brothers team in here. We've got Rotundo, Mike Rotundo and Kevin Sullivan, Brian Pillman, Scott Hall is in this. Uh, young, the Cowboy Scott Hall with the mustache and shit, uh, Dr. Death Steve Williams, Terry Gordy, Ron Simmons, Sid, Danny Spivey, Shane Douglas, Johnny Ace, Eddie Gilbert, all sorts of guys in this thing. And basically the rules are that everyone will pile into the first ring and you basically get eliminated twice. So in order to be eliminated from the first ring, you must be tossed over the top rope into the second ring, not just onto the floor, but you have to go into the other ring. Once you're in there, everybody who's in there will battle under normal battle royal rules. Just toss your opponent over the top rope to then eliminate them. The last two men standing in each ring will then face each other for the winning purse, which is, I guess, 15 grand. So everybody gets in there. They start fighting. It's all over the place. Um, in the first ring, after some guys get tossed over, we get Sid Vicious and a very young Brian Pillman as the final two in the first ring. Sid, who's a very young Sid at this time, too, but still looks like a million bucks. He's tag teaming with Danny Spivey as the skyscrapers. And another thing you'll notice about this show is that there is a shitload of double duty. A lot of people in this match would go on to wrestle later on in the night, and some even in the fucking War Games match later on. So it was crazy. Everybody was just out there doing everything on this show, and it was a blast. So like I said, Sid and Pillman 
were the final two in the first ring. Sid ducks a high cross body from Pillman. Pillman sends himself flying into the second ring, anointing Sid the winner of the first ring. So he basically just has to stand there and watch what's going on in ring two. So Pillman gets dumped out right away, and that leaves Danny Spivey, Mike Rotundo, and Dr. Death as the final three in the second ring. Rotundo gets eliminated, leaving Steve Williams and Danny Spivey as the final two. Now Doc goes to hit the ropes to perform a move on Spivey. He's tripped from the outside by Mike Rotundo, and then from behind, Danny Spivey comes and tosses out Steve Williams, and Spivey is now the winner of ring two. So you have the two skyscrapers, the two tag team teammates winning the two battle royals and now they have to face each other well teddy long their manager who's been observing from afar he comes down he's like no 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 we're not doing this these are my guys we're all on the same page we're on the same team what's going to happen here is they both win we are splitting the purse and that's it and he gets his boys out of there they actually agree we then went backstage where teddy is being interviewed excuse me by Gordon Soley and he basically reiterates what he said out there he goes these are my guys they're together blah 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 they're not going to fight each other and uh, whatnot so the skyscrapers are basically co-winners of this triple crown battle royal and they would be back out here later on to take on the dynamic dudes in a fucking hilarious match so we'll get to that one later it's on now to our first singles match of the night this one was hilarious flying Brian Pillman taking on Wild Bill Irwin. Now, some of you WWE fans might recognize Bill Irwin from 1996. He briefly passed through WWE as the goon. He dressed up in the hockey outfit and all that. This was around the time they were bringing in Dirty White Boy and Tracy Smothers and uh, Tom Brandy and a lot of those wrestlers to kind of come in and have, you know, be like a, a step above jobbers, you know, enhancement talent, but they would be characters and they try to get them over a little bit as well. Goon was a part of that, and it was funny to see Bill Irwin here. Not much of a match. This thing was a little bit ugly at times, but like I said, you know, Pillman was super young and super green around this point. But he was showing a lot of that Pillman athleticism, a lot of that athleticism that, to be perfectly honest, Pillman Jr. just doesn't quite have. I think Pillman Jr. is doing a great job in AEW. He is a dead ringer for his dad. He's getting better and better, and he's in amazing shape. But Pillman, man, it's tough to top this dude's athleticism. At one point during the match, he hit what, I guess he's done this a couple of times, but it took me a by surprise and he hit this really cool like sling blade looking clothesline that looked like a move that was before its time and a lot of shit that Pillman did back then was like that you know he uh, he kind of like invented almost cruiserweight wrestling in a, in a way because he was doing some shit back then that not a lot of guys if any were doing at all Pillman would then miss a very high missile drop kick from the top rope lands right on his back don't know how he survived that um, but in the end he's able to kick out Bill Irwin's pin attempts and winds up hitting the high cross body from the other ring for the win now Pillman used to use a top rope crossbody and a top rope clothesline every now and then to win matches. And he got dumped all the way in the other ring and he came flying over the top to nail Bill Irwin and pin him for the win. And good to see Flying Brian get a win in WCW. That was a fun little opener there and uh, always good to see Brian Pillman. We then cut backstage. Gordon Soley was our backstage correspondent throughout the whole show. He interviewed everybody, and it's always good to see Gordon Soley. This is kind of getting near the end of Gordon Soley, so uh, to see him here interviewing so many Hall of Famers was fucking great. So he is with Paul E. Dangerously. Paul E. is going to be talking about his upcoming tuxedo match later on in the show against what is really a babyface, Jim Cornette. Now, Heyman or dangerously, whatever you want to call him. He's got the cordless phone. I don't know if he was trying to pass this thing off as a cell phone or whatever, but it was, it was basically a cordless phone that you would find in any American family's kitchen in 1989. It was hilarious that he's got this thing. And he talks about how extreme he is, and he says that he's not afraid of anything. He stands on the beach during hurricanes, and he even once hired Rob Lowe as a babysitter. <laughs> so Rob Lowe was in the news back in those days. Uh, you can look that shit up yourself. And he also talks about 
Jim Cornette and the fall that he took in the scaffold match at Starcade at 86 that blew out like both of his knees or one of his knees or whatever it was. And he goes, I remember that. I was a photographer that night, and I saw how badly you got injured, and I'm going to target that knee, and I'm going to go after it. You are not going to be able to stop me now that I know what your weakness is, blah, blah, blah. And he is vowing to win the tuxedo match later on. So that would be coming up later, and we would also hear from Corny before we would get out to that match as well. Like I said earlier, tons of double duty here. Pillman and Irwin, too, I believe, are both in that battle royal. And so were the next four gentlemen involved in a tag team match. We've got the Dynamic Dudes. For those of you who don't know who the Dynamic Dudes are, they are Shane Douglas and Johnny Ace. You're very vascular, boss. That Johnny Ace. That's right. John Laurinaitis versus the Skyscrapers, Sid Vicious and Danny Spivey. So a lot of blonde hair going on here in this match. And the Skyscrapers, I always thought, were a really interesting team. And I've always liked Danny Spivey. And I've mentioned this before. Last time we talked about Spivey, I brought this up. If you ever want to hear the craziest fucking wrestling fight, you've heard of, you know, Sean and Brett. You've heard of Jacques Rougeau and Dynamite Kid. I don't think any backstage fight is as gnarly as what happened between Dan Spivey and Adrian Adonis. Apparently, Danny Spivey just fucking murdered this guy. And I've heard the story told about four or five different times from wrestlers, and they all say the same thing, that it was the most gruesome beatdown they have ever seen. So if you're interested in shit like that, look it up. It's an interesting story. And every time I see Spivey, I'm like, I would not fuck with that guy. That's for sure. So anywho, Dynamic Dudes, they hit the ring first. They've got their Frisbees and shit. They're dancing just to see John Laurinaitis doing this. Never gets old. They get high fives from Jason Hervey. And while this is happening, or I should say they before that happens, um, they high-five Jason Hervey, and then they pick out a little fan in the audience. They were doing this a lot on TV. They would pick a fan, throw him a Frisbee, take a picture with him, that sort of thing. So they get this little chubby kid out of the audience, and he just has, like, no facial expression, but he's super happy. He even chucks him a Frisbee, and they, you know, they take a little picture with him, and he's just kind of sitting there. It's the funniest shit ever. So they take the picture with the little kid. They high-five Jason Hervey, and then as we get into the match here, <clears throat> and we start rolling, JR, Jim Ross, decides to throw a little shade at WWE, talking about how here in WCW, these men are athletes. These are guys that are in great shape and are athletic competitors. This is not about snakes. This is not about pets. This is not about bodybuilders. Basically, you know, talking smack to WWE, oh, you're just cartoony pets, bodybuilder nonsense over there. Here in WCW, we've got the action. Here in WCW, we have the athletes. No shit. Right after he said this, three matches later, we, which we're going to talk about in a minute. We get Ricky the Dragon Steamboat versus Lex Luger. Ricky Steamboat comes out holding a fucking Komodo dragon, taking on Lex Luger, a future WBF superstar. So he just got done saying that WCW is not about pets and bodybuilders. Three matches later, pets and bodybuilders <laughs> is what happened. I found that to be fucking hysterical. So anyway, match is pretty ugly, as you would imagine. Shane knows what he's doing in there. A lot of these, these other big guys, and so does Spivey. You know, but, uh, you know, Sid's still a little bit green at this point. It wasn't really a Meltzer six-star classic by any means. Um, and in the end, it didn't look too good either. Now, it turned out to be the dudes were the more impressive team to me because they were putting up a really good fight against the larger opponents. And uh, it was even funny, one spot, one, one point in the match, you could see Sid call out this double drop dropkick spot. He basically yells it out, which is pretty funny. And the finish, like I said, wasn't any better. It was kind of botchy. Spivey power bombs Johnny Ace, but botches it. And it looked like he was just sweaty and he slid right off of him. Very lucky that he didn't land right on his neck or his head. And he just kind of took a little bit of a scary bump, but a power bomb that did not look good. If this was something that happened today, they would probably insist pick me up and do it again, you know, make it look better than that. But he didn't. He just had the shitty botchy power bomb, and then he pinned Johnny Ace for the win. So the skyscrapers got the win there. They looked pretty dominant with Teddy Long. But like I said, clunky looking match, a little bit sloppy and a terrible botch at the end, but still somehow managed to be extremely entertaining. And that's what I love about these days. We are backstage once again with Gordon Soley, this time with Jim Cornette. He's talking about, of course, that tuxedo match that's coming up next. And he knows that Paul knows about his knees and whatnot, but nothing is going to stop him from getting his hands on Paulie dangerously. And there was ever a time that he needed to step up and fight and whip somebody's ass. 
this is it. So Cornette is pissed, and he's out for blood against Paul E. later on. So that match is next. This might be my favorite match of all time. Jim Cornette, Paul Heyman in their prime, both young, both loud, both arguably the two best managers outside of the WWE at that point. And they would go on to become two of the greatest managers of all time, both Hall of Fame worthy for sure. So looking back on this now, this is what my girlfriend got a huge kick out of just to see these guys back in the day, back when Paul Heyman was younger and smaller. And he always reminded me of um, Jim Belushi, John Belushi's brother. And uh, he always said he patterned his character kind of after Michael Keaton in a movie that Michael Keaton was in. But whenever I saw Heyman back then, I always thought of Jim Belushi for some reason. They look alike. So anyway, they're both wearing their tuxedos. Jim Cornette's out there looking ridiculous. So is Paul Heyman. They get out there. They're ready to rock. Paul Heyman, not only does he have his cordless phone from my kitchen, he also has a tennis racket. I guess he's mocking Jim Cornette with that. Cornette, of course, has his tennis racket as well. Now, right off the bat here, Paul Heyman, or Paulie Dangerously, pulls a fast one, gets some powder, and blasts Jim Cornette in the face with the powder, giving Dangerously the early advantage. So Paul starts working over Jim Cornette, working his knee for a few minutes. I mean, it's 100% Dangerously in this match. I mean, he has really got the advantage on Cornette for a while until Cornette finally fights back with a series of punches, starts just kicking the shit out of Paul. He he rips Heyman's shirt off first, and uh, Heyman or dangerously starts to go for more powder to uh, you know try to regain the advantage. Goes to throw it in Cornette's face, but Cornette kicks the powder up into Paulie Dangerously's face and uh, blinding him. And then Heyman or Cornette, I should say, I'm getting all these names confused here, but Cornette is able to then grab Paul by the legs, trip him up, rip his pants off, and Paul Dangerously flees down the aisle in his little cute blue underwear as fast as he can and Jim Cornette gets the win here and that was nothing but fun if you want to watch something that's just fucking fun and ridiculous please I beg you watch Cornette versus Paulie Dangerously tuxedo match it's really great to watch it during sex try it out you'll love it never not fun to go back and watch that match. I've seen it several times. I get a kick out of it every single time, especially when you see where these guys are today, you know, and what legends they became and how uh, Heyman, you know, is still there and still a very, very, very big part of things in WWE in pretty much their top storyline with Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar and whatnot. So that was good stuff. Gordon is back at it again with an interview backstage, this time with Gary Hart. He is going to be representing the great Muta, as Jim Ross kept saying. Muto here was still kind of uh, a little bit new back in these days. He's going to be taking on Sting, the current television champion, for the title later on. So it's supposed to be an interview with Muta, but Gary Hart says that Muta is he doesn't want him to be distracted and that he's meditating in preparation for this match and whatnot. So Gordon is going to have to talk to him instead. We then get a pretty wild Texas Tornado tag team match between Mike Rotundo and Kevin Sullivan taking on a very young Steiner Brothers. Scott Steiner was decked out all in yellow. He was unrecognizable. I mean, it's still Scott Steiner and everything, but man, he looked very different. And of course, Rick Steiner was out there in the singlet and the earmuffs, and he had dogface gremlin on his gear, but still the Steiners hadn't really developed that Steiner personality or that Steiner look that they would have quite yet. But still, they were both two dudes that could wrestle rough and tough. And Steiners were always one of my favorite parts of WCW. I always think about, you know, like Pillman's and Dustin's and, and even Austin's and Steiner's and uh, Road Warriors and teams like that and Sting and Luger and shit. And Steiner's here to see them kind of starting out and see them relatively new onto the scene and how good they would become was a pretty big trip here. So the tornado match was everywhere and all over the place because everybody can be at the ring in the ring together. Uh, in the end, kind of there wasn't a lot of great finishes on the show because a lot of them were a little clunky. Sullivan has got Rick Steiner. He's holding him up kind of like in body slam position or, uh, you know, a fall away slam position or whatnot. And Scott Steiner then climbs to the top rope and hits a high cross body onto his brother on top of Sullivan and both Steiners pin Kevin Sullivan for the win and get the victory. So it was an okay match, probably one of the weaker ones on the show, but still very interesting, very cool to see how young the Steiner brothers were back in these days. 
Back to Gordon. This time he's with Sting, backed up by Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert, who was uh, flanking Sting a little bit around these times. And Sting said that this is his first time with Gordon Soley. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but in the interview, Sting claimed that that was the first time Soley had interviewed him, and that right there, my friends, is fucking cool. And he's very distracted. He's very nervous. You can tell that Sting is young. You can tell that Sting is green. But you can tell that Sting has seen some pretty early success since coming over, splitting up from the Warrior and the Blade Runner stuff and becoming that Sting persona. He's the television champion now. Fans were starting to take notice of him. I would say 89 was probably the year. Early 89 was when I when Sting hit my radar. You know, and I think it would be the following. I think it was 90 when he won his first title, like the following year or whatever. But he was starting to bubble around this time. And Sting was really popular with the audience. But you could still see that Sting, you know, he hadn't been in the spotlight that much. So he was a little bit out of it and he couldn't really concentrate. And he basically says, Gordon, I got to get out of here. And then Eddie Gilbert picks up the slack in the promo and says that he's going to be out there with Sting to make sure and neutralize basically Gary Hart, who will be backing up Great Muda later on. So that match is next. We've got Sting defending the TV title against the Great Muta, as Jim Ross said so many times throughout the match, which I got a huge kick out of. Um, young Sting, young Muta here. Very... Very interesting to see this match take place in 1989 for the television title, but good stuff here. You could see so much promise and potential in both guys and what good athletes they were. Uh, Sting winds up ducking the red mist about midway through the match. Referee Nick Patrick, who is your official for this match, gets hit with that red mist right in the face and goes down. Big moonsault to Sting, but no referee. Brand new referee runs out there. Tommy Young gets in the ring, but just a little bit late and counts the near fall Sting is able to kick out just barely after the late arriving second official. Eddie Gilbert, by the way, during this match was just a fantastic cheerleader for Sting. He was all over the place, very animated, hyping up the crowd, doing everything he could to get Sting going. I really got a kick out of Eddie Gilbert in this match. Miss him. He died the year I graduated high school. Can't believe he's been gone so long, but Eddie Gilbert was great. Um, we get for the finish here, kind of a controversial type of deal with the pinning combination. So it's belly to back from Sting onto the Great Muda. The referee counts three, but kind of both guys' shoulders were up. Sting he, Sting isn't supposed to have his shoulders down because he's trying to pin Muda with this move. So his shoulder is kind of up. But right before the referee's hand comes down for three, Muda lifts up his shoulder at the last minute but the referee doesn't notice it or doesn't see it, and he announces Sting as the winner. So Muda and Gary Hart then grab the championship belt, and they flee. They feel like they've won. Muda got his shoulder up, and Sting was pinned, and uh, it's kind of confusion. Nobody really knows what to do. Now, I believe later on in the show, near the end, because we would see Sting again, I believe they announced that the title would be held up. Muda would actually go on to win that vacated title in a match with Sting, I think a couple of months later in September is the, the way I believe that all went down. But good stuff there. Always fun to see a young Sting and a young Muda. Here's a match that wasn't bad, but holy shit, did the entrances here crack me the fuck up. United States title match. We've got Ricky the Dragon Steamboat challenging United States champion Lex Luger. We've got a Lex Luger interview backstage with Gordon Soley, and I guess there was a stipulation for this match that would be a no disqualification match. Now, Luger doesn't want to do that. He tells Gordon Soley backstage that he's not going to wrestle unless they drop that stipulation. So Gordon's like, okay, we'll see what happens when we go to the ring. Ricky Steamboat makes his way to the ring first, and this shit has to be seen to be believed. If you want to laugh your nutsack off, go watch Ricky Steamboat's entrance from this show. It is hilarious. They have got him. First of all, his, his music starts hitting, and his wife and kid come out first. Now, his kid was just like two years old, and I believe his wife's name was Bonnie. And when she was pregnant with their first child. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat was actually Intercontinental Champion, I believe, in WWE. He won the title from, from Savage at WrestleMania three. Now, he had wanted or requested some time off to be around for the birth of his son or whatnot, but he was the champion. Vince didn't really want to give him that, so 
he decided to leave and give his notice. So that meant they had to take the title off of him, and he passed it over to Honky Tonk Man, who would have that long run, and he would skip town and head to the NWA and become champion over there. Just a couple of months before this, at Wrestle War, he was world champion going into that match with Ric Flair where he lost the title. So he was now in WCW. And seeing Bonnie and the kid there, I always got a big kick out of that because I have heard people say that, you know, you know, I think she was kind of pushing for him to get the time off, or I've heard that a couple of times or whatever. I guess Bonnie wasn't really super loved in the wrestling world by a lot of the other boys and whatnot, just what I've heard in shoot interviews throughout the years. But I always find it funny that she came out there with a the kid, you know, and uh, Steamboat uh, kind of left for that reason. Now, Steamboat would be, Steamboat was one of those guys like Terry Taylor who would be back and forth between the co- two companies so much. You know, Steamboat left in 87. They took the belt off of him, but he did return later on in the year for Survivor Series, and he would even work the following year's WrestleMania in, at the WrestleMania Four tournament, losing to Valentine. And I think after that is when he skipped town and went to WCW and was there for a few years until returning around 90, 91 to WWE with the Dragon Deal and the fire breathing and all that shit he did before he went back to WCW in like 92, 93, 94 and spent some years there. So Steamboat had a really interesting career, the way he would bounce between the two companies. And here, getting back to his entrance, like I said, WCW always just came off and looked like this low rent, gritty version of WWE. And they had this motherfucker standing on like a platform or maybe like a surfboard or a stretcher, like the flat part of the stretcher. And they had wrestlers carrying him. It was like how they would carry Macho King or one, you know, when he, they would carry him to the ring on his throne or King Mabel or anybody that was just carried by jobbers to the ring. It was like that, but It wasn't like a big framed chair. It was just a board. So he's standing on this board. Basically, he has to surf on it and balance it while everybody walks him down to the ring. And he's also, in his hand, got a live Komodo dragon dressed up in a leather jacket with little spikes on it. And he's basically just holding it. He can't even move because if he moves too much, he's going to fall off this thing. I don't know how many times they had to rehearse this during the day, but this seemed like an incredibly huge risk and an unnecessary risk because if he would have fallen off that thing, he could have gotten hurt. He likely wouldn't have, but it would have been embarrassing as fuck. He would have been Ricky Shockmaster, man. He's got this Komodo dragon, and the way he's got to stand on this board, there's no support. He's got to trust these people below him to not wobble him and all that shit, and I don't even know how he's doing it. Like, if I was up there, I'm like, guys, this ain't working. But they basically walk him all the way down to the ring. He doesn't move. He just sits completely still the whole time. And it's even kind of wobbly as he's trying to get off of the board onto the apron. It's just, it's the craziest thing. This was not a good idea. And it didn't look good at all. And it was even funnier since just a couple of matches before, like I said earlier, Jim Ross is like, Here in WCW, this isn't about snakes and pets and bodybuilders. What do we got here? A guy coming out to the ring with a pet to take on a bodybuilder. (laughs) fucking crazy and if you think steamboat's entrance wasn't crazy enough get a load of lugers you know luger had a lot of this narcissist lex luger character in him even back then and uh, he was a few years in the business by this point and a veteran somebody really well known and a big part of the nwa back in these days and a great heel lex really was a good heel um i was never a big fan of lex in the ring i always just thought he was way too stiff he was stiff as a board so stiff that steamboat could have stood on him when he came out with the Komodo Dragon. And I just never really liked his wrestling style, but every now and then he could turn it on and you would see that Steamboat would give him a really good match here. But the entrance has got to be watched because he's basically on this, he's standing on this thing that's supposed to spin him around while he flexes or whatever. But about halfway through, it just stops and it just starts getting wonky. It's like he's standing on a Roomba or something. It just doesn't look good. So these are two of the most ridiculous ridiculous looking entrances that I've ever seen. You look at how special entrances can be now at WrestleManias and how elaborate they are. One of the best ones we've seen in really recent history was just a few weeks ago at All Out with the Lucha Brothers coming out to that whole deal. That was so good. But, you know, looking back (laughs) into these days, I'm like, what were they thinking? This was just so fucking awful. They tried to get cute and it just didn't work. They didn't have 
I think WWE could have pulled this off back in those days, but WCW just wasn't ready for this type of shit. It didn't look good, and it looked so ridiculous. I cannot express how badly both of these entrances looked. So go pull up your peacock and check those out and laugh along with us. It's great. You'll get a kick out of it. Anyway. There is a match to be had here. Now, when Luger comes out, he comes out second. Like I said, he gets on the mic and he reiterates what he said to Gordon Soley earlier on. He said, look, I am not getting in the ring and defending my title unless you drop that no disqualification stipulation, which in translation means Luger is a chicken shit little bitch. So he doesn't want to have that stipulation because he wants to cheat to try to get out of this match. And Steam, he gives Steamboat 30 seconds. you got 30 seconds to make up your mind or I'm out of here. So Steamboat says, okay, no problem. We'll do it. Drop the stip, ring the bell. Let's do this. And uh, they go out there and have a pretty good hard-hitting match. It's kind of one that might resemble something today between, like, I don't know, between, like, Sheamus and Matt Riddle or something like that. Just hard-hitting. Just smacking bodies, you know, a really rough, rough-and-tumble type of match. And to Steamboat's credit, he was able to pull a pretty decent match out of Lex Luger here. You know, and Lex Luger, like uh, like Steve Williams, Dr. Death was a, like, like, a lot like this too. When they got cooking, Batista had a little bit of that in him. It felt like when they got cooking and when they really wanted to turn it on, they could turn it on. And uh, here was an instance where I was actually somewhat impressed with Luger. I thought he put on a really good match here. He worked well with Steamboat. And uh, like I said, Steamboat was able to extract a good match out of Lex Luger, and that ain't easy to do. Now, in the end, Luger having them drop the stipulation comes into play here because then he goes out to the outside of the ring to get a chair, tries to use it, even shoves the referee away. But referee doesn't even call for the bell. He actually lets that shit slide. Steamboat then is able to block the chair shot and uh, get Lex Luger down in slingshot position and slingshot Lex with the chair into the buckle where he then hits his face. And then Steamboat picks up the chair and the referee tries to get it away from him and he shoves the referee away just like Lex Luger did. But the referee didn't call the bell, and then Steamboat whacks Luger with the chair. Then the referee calls the bell. Steamboat is disqualified, and Lex Luger wins via DQ and retains the title. The brawl continues after the match, and Steamboat winds up basically chasing him away with the chair. So Luger would live to defend that title another day. And like I said, it was a pretty entertaining match, and the crowd was into not only this, but everything on this show. So that match, despite the terrible... Uh, actually, I'm not even going to say terrible. They were funny. I'm, I'm not even giving them shit. It was so fucking funny, I'm not even mad. Uh, despite those ridiculous entrances, they were able to bounce back and actually have a pretty good match here. So check it out. Down to our final two matches uh, in our semi-main event, we've got the big War Games match. Now, this is a five-on-five -five War Games deal here. This one was crazy and wacky. Not as good as the Wrestle War 92 War Games that would be between the Dangerous Alliance and Sting Squadron a few years later. That one still probably ranks as my favorite War Games match of all time. This one was not quite that good, but still fun because you had some wild motherfuckers on these teams. Teams. The heel team was comprised of the fabulous Freebirds, Michael Hayes, Jimmy Garvin, and Bam Bam Gordy, along with the Samoan SWAT team, who of course were would go on to become the Head Shrinkers in WWE, Fat Two, and Samu. Their opponents were the Midnight Express, who had recently gone babyface with Jim Cornette, the Road Warriors, and Dr. Death Steve Williams. Holy shit. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. We get interviews from both teams. I love these. They're very reminiscent of the big Survivor Series team promos that WWE would do back in the 80s, you know, with all the baby faces and all the heels all just going nuts and Hogan just ripping his fucking shirt off and the Ultimate Warrior eating a live chicken or whatever. They're all going nuts. They're all coked out of their minds. They're all just ramped fucking up muscles and veins bulging out it was crazy and the two promos here were very similar although i think that the heels did a better job i mean the free birds were all over this place you had the samoans there just biting each other and licking each other while michael hayes is cutting the promo of a lifetime uh, elizabeth my girlfriend loves michael hayes she got a huge kick out of him and his character she'd never really seen him that way and the ridiculous shit he wore and the way he talked and the way he moved and strutted around out there he is a hoot so we got the big two team promos from both teams we go out to the match now 
And I think uh, the heels make their way to the ring first, followed by the baby faces. The road warriors are riding on the back of choppers, I guess. They didn't drive them themselves the way they would do at SummerSlam in 92. They actually rode on the backs, and uh, Paul Ellering was with them. So the baby faces actually had Paul Ellering and Jim Cornette in their corner, not too shabby. So War Games is about to kick off here. The first two people to start this off is Bobby Eaton for the baby faces and Jimmy Garvin for the heels. They get five minutes in there to do their their thing and we get terry gordy out next for the heels after five minutes followed by dr death at this point it had switched to two minutes so you got eaton garvin gordy and dr death out there there is w- the most impressive spot i've ever fucking seen in my life i've always known that dr death was strong but jesus man terry gordy is no small individual so doc picks up bam bam in the ring he lifts, he presses Gordy over his head, and he starts, boom, and he starts banging him on the top of the fucking ceiling of the cage. Incredible. I don't know what uh, Bam Bam Gordy goes, but it's over 300 pounds, and fucking Steve Williams is picking him up like it's nothing. It was great shit. Jesus, man, good spot there. We get Samu out next. The uh, The Samoans were dressed in more of the colorful type of attire, a lot like what the Islanders were doing in the 80s in WWE, Haku and Tama, before Tonga Kid had left. So um, it was kind of, it was always cool to see the the Island boys in wrestling. And here, Fatu and Samu had that short run for a little while in WCW before heading over to WWE. And of course, you know, Fatu would become Rikishi and all the things he would wind up doing in his career. So really cool to see a young Samoan team here in this match. Animal was out next for the baby faces, followed by Fatu. Then we get Stan Lane in. Then we get Michael Hayes. Then we get Hawk coming in last. Hawk enters the ring as the final guy and he climbs immediately to the top rope and tries to do a top rope clothesline but in those days you know the the ceiling was really low on that cage so there was no room to even stand up there and he was able to pull off a pretty good looking top rope clothesline but despite being limited by the low ceiling so that really looked good uh, when Hawk hit the ring and seeing how young and strong animal and hawk were especially hawk he was so good i mean the, the road warriors are the greatest tag team of all time but i honestly believe that hawk would have been a great singles wrestler like if there was no such thing as animal and hawk basically just kept his gimmick the way it is face paint shoulder pads just call himself hawk and that's all you have to do i think he would have been a champion i mean he looked really good i could definitely see him getting over back in 1980s NWA on his own, for sure. So um, he was just so good. It's always, uh, and so was, you know, uh, Animal. But, you know, Hawk just had that something special. He was a little bit more athletic, had a little bit better of a look, I thought, and was an absolute trip on the mic. Love me some Hawk. Rest in peace. In the end, we get all of the participants in the ring, which means the actual War Games match starts. Didn't see a whole lot of blood or grittiness in this. Like I said, the Wrestle War match a couple years later and some of the War Games matches that led up to this one, I think were better. But this one wasn't all bad. It was still a lot of fun and had some really interesting players in this. And like I said, it wasn't the main event either. So it didn't really have to be the greatest match you ever saw because it was only semi-main. In the end, we've got, I believe it's Hawk. He's the one going after... um, Jimmy Garvin, and he wants to basically break his neck. So he hits Garvin with a neck breaker, then basically gets him in like a a hangman neck breaker where he's basically pulling back on him like this, and he's just hanging him by his chin. And he's just, his fucking legs are flailing and kicking, and all the other heels are being preoccupied and neutralized by the other baby faces. And Garvin has no choice but to submit and surrender for his team, allowing the baby faces to get the win. And in another really fun, you know, kind of amateur move here by the baby faces, they just all start celebrating and high five and like, okay, let's go. And they all start leaving the ring, leaving poor animal laying in the ring, surrounded by a bunch of heels. So they look around, the heels look around like, well, shit, Animal's right here. All of his partners are on the outside of the ring. Let's close the cage and start beating the shit out of Animal. So just watching the baby faces all celebrate and hopping down the aisle like they're leaving and uh, watching Animal get his fucking ass kicked here was pretty funny. So they all try to get back in the ring. The baby face or the heels are holding the door shut. 
Baby faces are trying to climb the cage to get in. They can't do it. Finally, Hawk overpowers them, rips the door open, and is able to get inside and save poor animal. But that was pretty funny that they left their guy high and dry there. But the baby faces got the win in uh, the War Games match, and that was really, really fun stuff. That leaves us with our big main event NWA Championship match. Ric Flair defending against Terry Funk. Now, this was all set up on that Wrestle uh, War show that I mentioned. I think that was back in May of 89 and had one of the greatest singles matches in NWA history take place between Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat. As a matter of fact, I think this is the match. There's one classic match between these two guys that's actually on like a Triple H DVD, like the first one. I think that one was it. And Steamboat was the... uh, champion going into that it was a babyface match flair beat him terry funk was out there as like a judge i believe in the match after the match then challenged rick flair to a title match flair said no funk attacked rick flair and then hit him with like a pile driver on top of the table which uh, injured rick flair but if you go back and watch it's a lot like the pile driver it's it's uh, uh survivor series 91 with undertaker and hogan and he hit the pile driver on Hogan, and Hogan's fucking head was nowhere near the chair or the mat that he was supposed to land on. And uh, the Flair pile driver with Funk was kind of the same way, and Flair had to sell this injury. He did not wrestle during all of this stretch since that night with Ricky Steamboat. This was his first match, and he would, of course, have a pre-match promo with Gordon Soley. And Flair just looked amazing here. Seeing Flair in top form with the big gold belt talking to Gordon Soley. Right here, man. Right here. Good stuff. And uh, he was really playing up his injury. Gordon said, look, one pile driver, you could, your career could be over. You could lose the title. You could be paralyzed. Uh, they were calling it an injury to his axis vertebrae or whatever. And I think they were kind of also tying in the plane crash a little bit too because Ric Flair suffered a broken back in 1975 and then here what he had to go through with Terry Funk made everything a lot worse and they made it seem like Flair was number one not 100% and also number two taking a huge risk getting back in the ring a lot like how they made Edge's return to the ring feel you know what I mean with the neck stuff so it was all a pretty good story there and this was going to be a bout between two all fucking timers, that's for sure. It don't get no better in Southern wrestling than Flair and Funk, let me tell you. This thing was going to be wild and all over the place. Terry Funk, I must say too, <clears throat> excuse me, was in really good shape for this one. He was lean. He hadn't quite, he was still middle aged and crazy, but he hadn't quite gotten over the, uh, over the edge there where he was really looking kind of like weathered and tore back and unhealthy. He was very lean, looked like he'd really trimmed down and actually got himself in shape for this match. And he looked really good. And the two guys, of course, make their entrance. Funk is out there. He's got uh, Gary Hart with him. He's got the branding iron. He's got the hat, the whole cowboy look. And Flair comes out there looking like the champ that he is. Crowd going nuts. He's got the robe. He's got the belt. He's got the pyro. He's got everything. Looks so good. He's in there. The fans were very, very, very pro Flair. And this this match was not playing games right from the word go. The chopping and the punching intensified quickly. It started hard. They were outside on the outside of the ring almost immediately just beating the shit out of each other. It was a good match, but... It was sloppy because this is Terry Funk, and Terry Funk can be very unpredictable and very sloppy. Ric Flair sometimes can do a couple of things here and there that look a little bit odd as well. So when you combine these two, it made for an entertaining match, but a somewhat clunky one. Even some crappy-looking pile drivers, much like the pile driver that set this whole match up, some of it really didn't look that good looking back on it now but that's kind of that was par for the course back then and the fans didn't seem to give a shit at all they were having a great time here now we get near the end of the match rick flair locks in the figure four on terry funk the same move that he beat harley race and dusty Rhodes with to win the title he's got the move on funk he's trying to fight away gary hart who has the branding iron drops the branding iron near terry funk and then runs to the other side of the ring to distract the official. So when the official is messing around with Gary Hart, Funk is able to take the branding iron and he smacks Ric Flair right in the face with it. Flair then huge blade job. He's now busted open and Funk is able to 
work over Flair hard for the final few minutes until Funk, or until Flair, I should say, finally fights back. So Flair, the blood is flowing now. Funk is working him over. He's got the advantage. Flair is just a, a mess of blood. And if you feel like time is ticking for Ric Flair and the announcers are kind of selling it, oh shit, this is going to be the end of Flair. He better get it together. He winds up fighting back and is able to get his hands on the branding iron and knock Funk in the face with it. So now Funk is busted open from the branding iron shot and they start brawling on the floor and back in the ring and out to the floor again. So you got two bloody, crazy motherfuckers trying to tear each other's heads off. It was hilarious. The finish sees Ric Flair go for the figure four. Funk counters it into an inside cradle. Flair then counters that and the official counts the one, two, three and Flair is able to basically score a quick pinfall victory over Funk by reversing an inside cradle. So Funk now is pissed. Flair retains the title. The fans go wild. Great Muda hits the ring instantly right after the finish and nails Ric Flair in the face with the green mist this time. So Flair gets a face full of mist. He's getting worked over by Muda and by Terry Funk until Sting comes out to make the save. And this was a wild, wild, wild brawl. Sting and Flair battling Funk and Muda. They're outside of the ring. They're into the crowd. They're into the aisle way. Like two or three times, it looked like security had got these guys separated until they just came back together again and continued fighting. They try to cut to JR and Bob Cottle to kind of talk about the night. And as they're talking to wrap up the pay per view, everybody's brawling behind them and the fight is still going on. And like I said, it was broken up a couple of times only to resume again. Finally, when all of the dust settles, Metals, Flair comes over. Flair's got blood and green mist in his face. I had to use that image in the thumbnail here because Flair looked like he just looked like a mess. And he had that shit all over his face. And he was calling out Funk and he goes, brother, we've just gotten started. You know, this is just the beginning of the issue between you and me. And then he sees Sting and he brings Sting in, you know, and this is a nice big rub for Sting to be next to the champion like that. Signing off from the pay-per-view, cutting a wild promo. And, you know, this was all kind of the beginning of Sting, so it was really kind of cool to see, you know, him get this big-time pay-per-view rub and be involved in big situations with Muda, now with Flair. And like I said, Flair and Sting would go on to have a match not too long after this for the title where Sting would pick up his first world title win. So all in all, this was fun. Every match from top to bottom just had crazy shit going on. This was, like I said, it really embodied what the NWA and WCW shows were like because they were all over the place, you know, and they had a lot of just crazy shit going on. And, uh, you know, they would brawl and fight all the way up until the end. And that's not really what you saw in WWE. You didn't see pay-per-views end in the same way that this one did. And this was just interesting. It was fun. Crowd was hot. I would love to have my 13-year-old body in the arena for this show that night. It would have been a blast. And uh, all in all, good stuff here at the Great American Bash. So if you are ever curious about these days, if you've never really seen much from the 80s and or maybe not from WCW, because we do some WCW reviews every now and then on the channel, but not nearly as many as we do for WWE. So it was cool. I'm glad that Mike had uh, sponsored this one to be made because I love looking at old WCW shows, especially one from this time period, how interesting it was and all of the great talent that was spread out across this great pay-per-view card so take a look at it if you're bored one night if you're tired of wwe's current product or if aew isn't isn't on tv maybe pull up your cock and pull up great american bash 1989 and take a look you won't regret it great stuff so Hope you enjoyed this review. We will try to do a few of these throughout the year or throughout the re duration of this year. If you would like to participate or sponsor your own video, you can send yourself over to the Patreon page. Link is right there in the description. Instructions on what to do there if you would like to have a review done or sponsor a review. Uh, otherwise, we will try to do more of these. And of course, we are going to continue on with as many classic watch-alongs as we can as well. But since we're doing watch-alongs every Wednesday for Dynamite, I figured I would try to mix it up a bit and do some classic watch-alongs with some classic reviews. So you can look forward to that 
for the duration of 2021. I want to thank you guys for being with us here today. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button on your way out the door and share this video and tell your friends. The algorithms right now on YouTube do not like us, so I am not expecting this video to perform very well. So the likes will really help. And if you do that, I would greatly appreciate it. You guys take care. Have a good rest of your night. And thanks for being here for this classic WCW review. And Mike, thank you again, my man. Peace. Thank you.